Eric Small, a.k.a. Mr. Core, a.k.a. Confused Muscle, is a two-time American Ninja Warrior and has been in the game for 15 years as a fitness specialist. He's trained people such as Nisi Nash, Jordan Sparks, Safari, Lena Waith, Eric Billinger, Sherry Shepard, Nick Cannon, and the list goes on. We discuss how he moved to Los Angeles with $250 in his pocket, a bike, and a dream of becoming a celebrity personal trainer. Life as a personal trainer ain't easy, and Eric joins Peaks and Valleys to talk about it right now. They say it is the darkest before the dawn. But what do you do before the dawn comes when all you have is candles and night lights guiding your path until morning, until your sight is restored and you can see your way out, your way through, your way to the other side. You push with all your might until the day breaks and your victory comes. This is Peaks and Valleys with TK Trinidad. Welcome, folks. I am incredibly excited for this guest. He is a two-time American Ninja Warrior fitness specialist, 15 years in the game. You can call him Mr. Core. You can call him Confused Muscle, or you can just call him Eric Small. Please welcome to Peaks and Valleys. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. You have done Appreciate so much. a lovely intro. Oh, yeah. No problem. You've done so much. Um, and, uh, you know... We kind of, I just want to leave the, the, the whole thing about Peaks of Valley is just talking about your journey. So when people like see you, you know, American Ninja, you know, you're training Nick Cannon along with a lot, a lot of other celebrities are like, well, of course he's, he's been doing it, you know, all his life and life is gravy for him because, you know, these people are paying him crazy amounts of money, but that's not how life works. Um, so take me through a journey where, you know, you went through that, uh, that peak, um, sorry, that valley where it's just like, ish got real. I mean, as soon as I stepped, I mean, I'm originally from L.A. I was born in, in Inglewood, but I live near Bakersfield, Fresno area. So uh, eight years ago, I, I wanted to pursue my, my career as a celebrity trainer. Like I told myself that's my title. That's what I want to go after. And I was going through some hard times at the time, living in a small town called Tulare, California, near between Bakersfield and Fresno, California. Damn. So Mary and her, I didn't have a lot going on for myself out there. So it was like. I did, I did all my work that I needed to get done in Tulare, so that way I'm able to save a, little, save a little bit of money to come out to L.A., but fortunately, I only came out here with $250 and my bicycle and some clothes. What? Um, yeah, I came out here with nothing. Yeah, like, it was my last <laughs> resort was to come out here and just believe in myself and do everything I can do to make it and survive, Ooh. so... I came out here and um, actually we both know him, uh, Gary Matthews uh, from G Train. He uh, he knew me before I moved out here, so I asked him if he knew any clients of his or anyone that had a room for rent, and he didn't. But he said the, the, the gym that we worked at, that he worked at, had rooms for rent, but no one really knew about it. So he talked to the owner. The owner said, "Hey, we got a room." So I came out here that night. That mm -hmm. few nights later. And the room got taken up because I, I came a day too late. So they gave my room away. So I'm out here with my clothes, my ex at the time dropped me off. And I'm like, I got to make this work. So Gary said, there's an attic space that they said that they'll give you for 250. I said, I'll take it. I didn't even look at it. I just said, I'll take it. I'm already out here. So mm -hmm. I go up the stairs, go through the locker, climb up a ladder. And there's a room, you can't even stand up. There's no window, you can't fully stand up. There was just an empty space and a little mattress on there. I was like, all right, day one, here we go. So, but, yeah. <laughs> so the, the other room that was for rent, did it, it cost more than 250, right? Yeah, it was probably like 400, 350. But you so actually how had you a gonna... privacy room, like you actually could walk around. I, had, I could walk. Right. So how were you gonna cover that if you only brought 250 with you? That's the thing. Like, I came out here to work, so I went straight down the street to the, the park, you No know, Hope Park down the street where it was at, and I'm out there. It was 95, 100 degree weather. I'm out there trying to promote myself. I'm charging 20, 30 bucks a session, and I mean, I started getting people. I got a couple people, and then um, I was surviving off of Snickers and protein shakes, and then I think three weeks after being here is when I finally got my first client. Like She found me on Instagram, and that's one of the biggest blessings at the time was Instagram because I always promoted myself. And so this lady, um, Shamika, she was uh, Macy Gray's background dancer or a singer at the oh, time. Nice. And she wanted to lose a, 
think 20, 30 pounds. So we went, she signed up for a month and that was the start of my, my real journey. Like I was like, okay, I made some money. Now I can like, my mind's clear because at the time you're going through all the hard times and you're mm-hmm. surviving off a little bit of food and all that. And you're trying to keep, stay humble and not let anything show your, your energy show. So after that first client, that's when I start feeling more, like more it's like I'm stable now, even though I wasn't, but it was it was a big relief. Wow. So like the goal, of, so what's the difference between a personal trainer and a celebrity trainer? Because you went in specifically like, and this kind of talks to um, you know, your energy, like be very specific with what you want done in your life. So why why did you choose like per um celebrity personal trainer? Um, I think it's because like I attract to them because even before I moved out here, my one of my cousins, uh, Derek Mitchell, he's a producer. He was working with Black Eyed Peas at the time, so I was traveling back and forth every other weekend on the bus on the Greyhound just to stay the weekend at my cousin's. And we go out. I go to a studio session, and these people are like, they like me. They like my energy. I wasn't trying mm-hmm. to be a groupie around them. I mean, like I said, I've been in Cali my whole life, so I've seen celebrities my whole life. So there's nothing. To just be normal with them and so that's why a lot of people i feel like celebrities they want to train with me because like i don't give off no type of negative energy or there's no type of groupy energy and i know how to work with people like i know how to mm-hmm. understand their body and and uh how they feel and i have common sense most of the time when it comes to certain things and i think that's a big key in um this industry world but i mean after being a celebrity trainer for eight years like i, I feel like now I think after two years, I was just like, I don't even like this title no more because at one point I was only getting uh, influencers, celebrities, and so n- normal, hardworking people would be intimidated to hit the contact me. Right. And so I was. Because they think like they I can't afford losing. you. Yeah, they think they couldn't afford me. But with me, like I said, I came from the bottom, so I'm always working a deal with somebody. Like if you do photography, hey, I need some pictures. Let's, I'll give you six sessions. You can give me six sessions of uh, your photography. Uh, video, anything, anything I could bargain, I, I'm mm-hmm. willing to work with people just because, like I said, I don't, I don't like turning people down. If you can't afford an hour, I'll cut the price in half. We'll do a 30 minute session. Like, right. So, yeah, yeah. I remember seeing um, your IG. So, for you guys who don't know, so I know Eric from G Train Fitness. That's where I started training. A lot of people go there. Um, and I knew of you before I even went to Drew Chain. So when I saw you, I was like, oh, Dan, that's that dude from, that's that super crazy dude who does this. You guys need to go on his Instagram page because he does okay. some stuff that is just like wild, like just beyond what the average normal human being is supposed to do. Um, so I remember seeing you, I was just like, oh, dang, I've seen him on his Instagram all the time. And it's crazy because you did tell me about your story and you would never like think like, Oh, he, he was essentially like living in a small attic, which is in LA. And that's why I was shocked, like 250 in your pocket and a bike. Like I, my recommendation to anybody who moves to LA, one, you need to come with the car. Like that's my personal thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but I know a lot of people who came without cars, but it's just, yeah. it just makes life just a little bit easier. And then 250 can go in LA within five minutes. Yeah, 250 is gone. In, in three days, just eating. Yeah, it's crazy. So like through all of that, so now you're in LA and now you're kind of establishing yourself. Was there any other hardships that you kind of experienced like growing pains as far as either growing the business or even personal that it was just kind of like, man, is this, you know, am I supposed to keep pushing th- this this journey for this routine or this uh, route for myself? I think um, what would go past everything I've been through is with the, the relationship I had with my oldest son. Uh, Tariq, when she's 16. Um, I had him in 2005 when I was 21. So, I mean, I had him at a young age and me and his mom really, we didn't hit it off that good. You know, it was one of the things where we messed around and he got pregnant, she got pregnant. We tried to make it work, you know, it didn't work. Um, and so, I mean, whatever the reason is, it's been, it's been hell trying to be in his life since then. I mean, we broke up when he was one. Mm-hmm. Uh, it wasn't my fault, let's just say that. And I've been to court probably 10 times since he's been born just for visitation rights. And like how she forced, she fought me through that whole process, not letting me try to get him lying about me and all that. So that's probably been, that's probably why I'm so strong and humble is because I've been through hell and back just with 
trying to be in my son's life. And this is going on 16 years to this day still. Um, a lot of people know, don't know, so you're kind of the first people, first person to ever kind of know now. So two years ago, I actually got full custody of him after all the years of battling, trying to get him. Mm -hmm. um, I got him. I, I hadn't seen him for eight months prior to the court date. So that really pushed me again to go ahead and file the court papers again. So I'm so used to doing it, so I know how to do all that. And so um, the judge, she didn't show up a couple of times. So the judge looked into the records and see what was going on with her and everything. And so it wasn't looking good on her hat, on her on her side. So the judge reversed the the court order, which was I see him every other weekend, but he stays with his mm -hmm. mom. So he reversed it. So now I get him full time and she gets him every other weekend. Nice. So I was it was the biggest proudest moment of my life just knowing that all the years that I couldn't see him all the birthdays I missed and now I got full custody of him and so it took him a week to find him because he was homeless living in the motel six wait what yeah he was homeless when his mom and everybody was homeless living in the motel six so like the investigators it took after I got custody of him I was like I don't know where he's at so it took him like I said it took him a week to find him he wasn't enrolled in school for like the past six, seven months. And that's another reason why they couldn't find him because he wasn't enrolled in school. Oh my so God. I picked him up. The detectives told me they found him a week later, met them halfway in Bakersfield. It was the first time I seen him in eight, nine months. So then we, he moved out here. And so that was, like I said, I was so happy about that. But then, you know, last year was a hard time for everyone. The COVID hit, um, he, he graduated eighth grade, but he did it from his room. And then he became a freshman in his room. And so like, it was kind of, and I'm trying to work just to, to provide for both of us. I mean, I'm a single right. father now at this time. And so, I mean, I know he missed a lot of his friends. He missed his mom. His mom was going through some stuff personally. And so she wasn't really there. I didn't get no help from her. So it was like, I had to work a lot. So I think uh, when we had in August, so May, um, I could just tell something was wrong with him. Like he wasn't talking to me. He just wasn't the same person anymore. And so I could tell he wanted to move back with his mom. So his mom was in his ear and everything. So um, some things happened where I tried to punish him by taking his phone. He didn't want to give me his phone. He tried to walk away. I grabbed his arm. He started panicking, screaming, went to the his room. We had some words. I had to calm down. He calmed down. And then he, he wanted to move back with his mom. He called the cops on me after that incident. So he wanted to move back with his mom. So I'm like, hey, you're 16. Um, I've done everything I can to be in your life. Like people that really right. know me know all the hard time, like everything I put up with his mom and just try to be in his life. So I had to let him go. So it's like, I've done everything I can. So yeah, it's been wow. a while been a rough year like like you said you'll never know that i'm going through anything because i don't show that like i just love showing positivity and like i'm so closed in and private with my life to where like i can be homeless right now you won't even know i could be at my friend's crib doing this interview you wouldn't even know right now and so so yeah. there's just a lot with that so I mean, I can't speak of that one. I don't have kids and two, I'm not a like father. So, cause you, you, you have the stereotypes specifically with black men, you know, saying that they don't take care of their children. Right. And so now, you know, you're fighting to at least see your child. Like, what is that? What is that process like? Cause at, so at, during that time, did you, were you like, you know, I'm, I'm trying and the system is not for me and his mother is not for me like why like did you want to give up essentially oh yeah i, I actually did give up at one point because it was just mentally i couldn't do it no more and i was stressed out I, I didn't couldn't focus on nothing else and it was just like no matter what i did and how positive i was about doing it she always got her way like they always looked towards the mother um over the father and I always said, the only way I'm going to get him is if she's on drugs or something like that. And I mean, obviously, I mean, it did happen that way, but it was like, I had to wait 15 years for that to happen. And hearing everybody say, oh, just wait till he gets older. But each month, it hurts more and more. And each day, it hurts right. more. So you can only say that and feel that way for so long. Like I said, I went through it for 15, 16 years now. But I mean, honestly, prayer and patience is all I can really do. 
and just try to think positive about it and you know just always think that God's gonna make a make a way for it to happen. So now you finally you finally get him um and you get him at that age where you know teenagers are not I remember when I was a teenager um you know we think we know everything all that stuff so you get at him at an age where you know it, they're struggle. They're they're trying to grow and be adults and learn new things and you know speak for themselves. So you know when he made that decision that he wants to go back home, like how did you? I mean, how did you handle it and how are you handling it now? I mean, it, it hurt at first. It just hurt the way it happened. Like he could have been told me months ago that he wanted to go back. I would have said no. You can't go back. Let them talk to your mom. Let them interview your mom to see if she's fit to keep you. Don't mm -hmm. you remember how I, I found you, how I got you? Like, that was my only concern. So it was never an issue that, like, no, you have to stay with me. I don't care, this and that. It was just, there was no communication. And so we had to find out, the, I had to find out the hard way. And so, I mean, dealing with it now, I mean, it still hurts. It doesn't hurt as much as it did, like, prior, right after it happened. But I just had to accept it. It's like, whatever makes you happy, just, you have to do it. And um, for me, at one, at at that time, it was just like, I have to let him go because just for him calling the police on me, it just, that hurt more than anything because right. they've all done that, done that to me before. And it was like, I have flashbacks almost to where it was like, I'm doing too good to be dealing with the cops right now, the police. So it was like, it, that was the most hurtful experience dealing with this whole situation was that part. But, and then him not talking to me, obviously, but it was just like, hey, Deep down, I know what I've been through and what I had to what I had to go through to be in his life. So I couldn't really be too hard on myself. Right. And then, what's you guys' relationship now? Mm -hmm. Hardly talk, but it's teenagers. Like I said, it is what it is right now. I just have to wait for him to come around. He'll come back. Right. Around. I mean, I love. Him yeah, I mean, yeah. as long as they know where to find you, I mean, that's always mm -hmm. the most important thing. And uh, finding you is not hard. Yeah. Uh, you you have social media everywhere. Um, I just Googled your name and you're like on everything. Um, so anything fitness related. So like with that all happening, you have like American Ninja and then, you know, now you're, now you're seeing videos of you training Nick Cannon. So like, how did that all kind of come about? Um, it all starts with like when celebrities or just people in that, in that industry world, they, they usually already follow me. But it just takes a while for them to set up that meeting. And that's what happened with Nick. Like, he followed me for about a year or two. And he always said, like, every six months, like, I still want to work with you, but I'm busy. As the whole world can see, he's always busy. Mm -hmm. So I just knew, like, it's going to happen, but it's just not. It might not happen when I want it to, but it will happen. And so um, I think exactly it was uh, Father's Day. I was having lunch with my youngest son, my six-year-old, uh, Lamar. And he DM'd me, said, hey, I'm back in town, I'm, I'm ready to get started. And so can we meet the next day? So that following Monday, I met up with him and we've been rocking with each other since. And he's one of the most humblest, like, I mean, he, he sets me up. It's crazy because I've worked with a lot of people and there's a lot of people that try to elevate me, but he, he does it effort, effortlessly. Like mm -hmm. he'll just, hey, come out of the office. I wanna show you, I want you to, be here when such and such be here this and that like stuff little stuff like that it can go a long way in my career so i appreciate the little things he do um that's probably little to him but major to me so right I mean, there's nothing i can say bad about him I mean, our our kids are best friends his four-year-old is best friend of my six-year-old so it's just it's, it's a good bond right now so i, I appreciate him Especially the way when he the, uh, the time he came in because I had just got custody of my son two months before that so timing yeah so my son was homeless he moved out here and met Nick Cannon the same day he was homeless so it was, <laughs> it was crazy so so then like take me through like what Nick Cannon wanted what Nick wanted as far as a workout because you can kind of see like his body has changed drastically. Um, so like, what did you, what you, can you give some tips to some folks? Like, what did you do to have that, make that transformation? Um, I knew his, him going into it, his goal was mainly just to get ripped. He wanted, he always said, I want to look like you. So, I mean, 
I, I do when someone wants to get ripped and really tone their body up, I don't really go too heavy on weights. I do comfortable weight, comfortable um, weight, more reps. And mm-hmm. I emphasize on calisthenics, which is your own body weight. So he'll do a lot of crazy stuff on a pull up bar, same things I kind of do. And for me and my experience with my body and everyone else's body, I use that with it just changes your body so fast if you know how to form and live together like I know how. And so pretty much I just put them through that routine of just mixing calisthenics with weights. I mean, we'll go heavy sometimes, but majority of the time it is calisthenics. Make sure his diet his diet is right, um, low carbs. Um, I try to go no sugar with him. Um, he, he loves candy. I love oh. candy. So it's like that's their weakness. But that's not even once about we that. cut that down, yeah, you can see the stomach, the abs coming in more. So, you know, I keep it real basic with him. Plus, he has lupus, so that was kind of a challenge because a lot of the, the his fat store in the stomach when you have mm-hmm. lupus. And the inflammation, like your body's inflamed and stuff like that. So I had to work around that, which was kind of, it took a delay. But once I got him mentally right, as far as eating better, it it helped out a lot. So, so, And so, like, tell me, so for the people who, I mean, you have a lot of people moving to LA. Yeah, like what you're, the two stories that you kind of gave me is like the, people experience this all the time. So you have a lot of people moving to LA. So that's one. Um, And then you also have a lot of dads who are dealing with, like, you know, you never hear the dad side of the story. And of course there's two sides of the story. So, you know, don't, y'all don't come at me, the moms and all this other stuff. There's just two sides to the story. And you just, you know, right. You know what I'm saying? So what do you have, like in one sentence, uh, what would you say to somebody to encourage them to kind of keep pushing through? Um, I would say, just let it happen when it's supposed to happen and be patient. And like I said earlier, pray about it. I pray about everything. Um, or if you don't believe in prayer and just anything that can help you focus and meditate and on the things that you need to focus on and make that situation happen or go better for you. Like just, there's so many negative things that can, some, um, so many negative things that, that goes around in your head to where it's just like, you don't want to think about nothing else, but it's not going to mm-hmm. get better. But you just always got to know that you're going through hard times because there's a lesson. And after this hard time, you're going to get blessed with something. Yeah. I mean, I feel like and I've lived in a couple other states, but I feel like L.A. in particular just has a you need a, a certain type of mentality to yeah. one, survive and then to thrive. Like there are a lot of people surviving but they haven't elevated their mentality to start thriving. There's a big difference between the two. I think you just need that, that right mentality. And if you don't have it, you're going to be in and out in LA in less than two years. If not, and not less than that. Multiple times. I've seen so many people in and out and they always wonder how I can still smile and not show that I've been through anything. But it's just like how you said, it's just some people have it, some don't. I'm, I'm thankful for all the hard times I went through in the past because it prepared me for this type of lifestyle out here because, right. I mean, the way I grew up, sometimes I just want to just slap somebody, but it's just like, I can't do that because <laughs> the way I was raised and how hard I worked for to get here, but right. I'm all about respect and everything, but there's so many people that, that don't think that way and wonder why their career or why someone don't like them or they don't get this attention that I get from people. It's because it's, it's your attitude and just mentality of, of, of life. Right. Well, t- tell me about that because there has, there's a certain type of, I think part of it is just like, you know, your genetic makeup as far as personality, but like growing up, we, we watch as children, we watch everybody and everything and we pick up certain social cues. So like for you to get to this point and, you know, I definitely agree people particular celebrities run a rock with somebody who like is not is just very low key you know just does what they're what they say they're going to do person of the word so like who in your life kind of inspired you or who does you know your mannerisms who does, who do you take after definitely my mom she she made sure that i was respectful like i don't I can step into your studio and there's five people. I'm greeting every five, every everybody that's in the, in that room. Like I've seen that in LA. I could be standing by somebody, somebody like I'm not even there, and I, I I can't stand that. Like, and I'll let you know, like, hey, I'm Eric. Like, I don't care. But, 
<laughs> but that's one thing is just be respectful. Treat everybody like they're the janitor. Like I said, like everyone in the room is somebody. And then um, also it's just like, yeah, the manners. Um, I was raised by a lot of older guys, older people. So it's like OGs. I, I just, I'm always observing things. Like I, I observe my surroundings all the time. Like I, I'd rather just listen than talk and just see mm -hmm. what's going on. So I feel like just being raised around older people, even in high school, I hung out with juniors and seniors. They just, they like my personality. And I, I mean, of course I was goofy and stuff in high school, but it was for some reason they kept me around. And I just, yeah, I, just, I learned a lot of game from the older, older, older people. And then um, tell me how American Ninja Warrior started, because I mean, I see, I see a lot of bloopers. Um, so when I saw you, it was like, definitely you can, I mean, that that's in your, your, your foray. So did they contact you or did you sign up or like what, what yeah. happened for you to be on the show? So how that works is you have to, you have to, uh, put in a two minute, like a two or three minute submission video of what you're going through in life. If you have a mil uh, illness or you just, you're going through hard times, honestly, they care more about your story than your physical abilities. And they mm -hmm. even told me that no matter what I can do and all the crazy stuff I do, they fell in love with my story. Like I said, the $250, my kids. So that's what put me on the show is my story. Mm -hmm. And then, um, but yeah, so that was one of the greatest experiences I've ever experienced just because I've always wanted to be on the show. And everyone always told me from, from back five, six years ago, like, hey, you should be on the show. And then I finally had a chance. But people don't realize how, how difficult and how much technique that you really need to be on that show. You can be the strongest person, you have the strongest core, but technique is everything. So mm -hmm. I learned that real quick. I fell short <laughs> on the first obstacle and fell in the water. And my six year old, well, he's four, he was four at the time. He's to this day, he still makes fun of me for falling in the water. He was wow. There. Yeah. <laughs> So, <laughs> so do you get to do a test run or it's like, okay, you, oh, no. you made it, you're on the show. And that's Here another thing, a lot of people don't realize. So. You get there at a certain time. Say I get there at four o'clock. You check in. They ice you. That means you're sitting for about four or five hours before you even see the obstacle course. So we're waiting for four or five hours. Eight o'clock comes. All right, we're going to do a run through through the course. We're going to give you the rules, the regulations, all that. So we don't see the course until an hour or two before we hit the course. Wow. And at that time, it's in March. We filmed the Universal Studio. It was freezing up there. And so you're cold, you're nervous. And then six hours later of waiting, now it's time for you to go on. And then you're rugging in within 10 seconds, five seconds. You wait for a whole Jeez. year to be on the show and then it lasts five seconds. <laughs> it sounds like a fitness competition. That's how I felt. I did a fitness competition. I trained for like 17 weeks. I was on yes. stage for like less than three minutes. I'm like, I'm never doing this again. This was, yeah. uh, I'm good. Um, so <laughs> tell us about the current projects, stuff that's coming up with you. You have a lot going on. Um, so uh, tell us what to, what to look out for, um, how people can find you, all that good stuff. Um, so my website is confusedmuscles.com, Instagram, anything social media is confused muscles. Um, I'm actually, I've been working on a book since the pandemic last year. Uh, it's been going on about a year and a half. It's called Fitness Changed My Life. It's pretty much all the stuff I've told you plus more in detail. Like I'm, I'm people will have a whole different respect for me after they re read this book. Nice. Um, and so that's in the works. Hopefully by October is done. I have a short documentary that my friend from back home is, is making for me. We've been working on that for about a year and a half too. So uh, I'm really excited for those two. Um, I do have a um, I partner up with Nick. I helped him build his his gym called Incredible Gym. It's in Hollywood Hills, right below Yamashiro. The view is incredible. Uh, it's ironically, the, it's, it's the best <laughs> view. It's the best yeah, gym you can't view get in LA. There. Yeah. So yeah, you could check that out um, on IncredibleGym.com or my website ConfusedMuscles.com. Is you can see the classes and stuff on there. But yeah, I'm excited. I was excited for that because that was my first time ever designing a gym. And so I, from everyone that looked at it and seen it, they love it. So I'm, I'm proud. That was a proud moment. Um, but yeah, I, I got got some stuff coming up. <laughs> so wait, you designed, you helped design the gym? Yeah, I just told the workers what to do. 
that's like you just say it like just yeah you know that's <laughs> just that's just what it no, is like i said it was my first time ever doing it. i was blessed with an opportunity it was it was a year and a half in the making um as soon as i walked in he he told me what his goals were and mm -hmm. as soon as he left the room i just started going on my phone looking up different ideas i like and he just gave me the green light to tell the workers what to do i put all mirrors on there i put pull-up bars because like i said i like calisthenics and Mm -hmm. Yeah, we just made it work. Put the red lights in there. So yeah. Yeah, it's very, it's very like uh, aesthetically pleasing. I do like the like. I always it say, like I you, <laughs> yeah, I always say like, oh, I, I want to come down there, but you know, me and traffic just don't agree that well. But one day. <laughs> um, so the last thing before we get out of here, any crazy celebrity stories? I mean, you don't. Well, I'd prefer you to say their name if they don't mind. But um, like I remember way back when I was a. I was a personal trainer because I think I feel like any athlete who went to university, um, you know, they have that transition period where they're trying to figure out what they're doing with their life. So I was a personal trainer for a hot second. And I remember I trained somebody and she's like, I'm going to the bathroom. And she never came back. Um, and oh, we were doing like a track okay. workout. So um, <laughs> do you have any like, you know, you have one like crazy celebrity story where you're just like, man, I will never forget this. I, it's not a really a celebrity. I mean, they it's. I actually have two, but I'll tell you this one. So I got referred by these guys. I used to always see in my gym. I, I was they to this day they said I was the only one that really talked to them. So mm -hmm. by them doing an event at this lady's house, the lady asked these guys from my gym if they knew any trainers. And so like I said, just for me being nice to them all the time, they referred me. They didn't really know me. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest biggest referrals I've ever had. So the lady called me told me where she lived. She lived about 30 minutes from me. Um, I had to find out some quotes, the prices, the charger, just because I had never traveled that far at the time. Told her the price, told her I'd do 12 sessions up front. She said, okay. And I was just like, oh, shoot, I never charged no one this much amount. And she just <laughs> said, okay. Like, I was scared to even quote her that much. Mm -hmm. Go to the house, biggest house I've ever seen in person. And I, she didn't look familiar, so we trained everything. Um, her husband came down, gave me a check, met me. I left. I Googled the name on the check, and it said, man, won $120 million in the lottery. So I was like, I've never met anyone that won the lottery. And on top of that, I'm training someone for two months that won $120 million in the lottery, one of the biggest houses I've ever seen. So that was crazy. a cool, crazy time. Um, and she never made mention of it? She was just like, oh, I just want to lose weight or whatever her goals were? Yeah, she just told me her goals, and then after two months, I got her to her goals, and, and we still we still friends, like we still keep in contact off of social media. But yeah, it was that was a cool experience. Um, another experience, um, I trained Kale Mitchell off and on for our, for about six about six years now, and uh, two years ago he was on Dancing with the Stars, and so we had mm -hmm. took about a six seven month break. He was like, Eric, I, I need you. Like I'm going, I'm about to be on Dancing <laughs> with the Stars. I'm doing choreography lessons four or five hours a day. I want to do all the crazy extreme core chat stuff that you put me through in the past. So mm -hmm. we went to work for about two months and he didn't win. He got runner up, which he should have won. He got cheated after that final episode. But yeah, so that was a cool experience too. I mean, there's so many. Um, I trained Lena Ray. Uh, one time she was late consecutive days. And at this time, this, this part, this, particular day I was going to tell her hey I can't you can't be late like I, I'm, I'm traveling to you this and that so she right. had me waiting outside for 15 minutes and I was going to tell her I was kind of mad she's like I'm so sorry I just got a call saying I got nominated for an Emmy and I was like oh shit I can't even say <laughs> <laughs> you can't even do so, nothing that. So I started training her like two or three weeks before she won her her Emmy so that was a great right. experience is it crazy to you that, I mean, I guess it's just the ebbs and flows of, you know, your body, right? So like you, you help somebody get to like the best shape of their life and they're like, all right, cool. I, I got it from here. And then yeah, they call yeah. you back like six months, a year later. Yeah. And you're just like, man, what, how many pizzas did you have? Like, <laughs> like, no, like I, what, I what kind of goes through your mind? I never judge anyone. I mean, sometimes you gotta live your life. <laughs> sometimes you go through things. So things are going to change. Your habits are going to change. But right. I mean, and that's another thing with me. If someone wants to stop working after they reach their goal, I'm not really, I'm not salty about it. I just, I don't really, I don't really um, 
think that someone's going to train with me longer than three months anyways because I'm known for giving fast results. And so once I give you the results, if you're disciplined to maintain your your, your, your goals that you I helped you achieve, go ahead. I mean, it saves you money too if you know what you're doing, so go ahead. But yeah, sometimes after a few months, he's like, oh, I can't. I thought I could do this by myself, but I didn't do, <laughs> do you just shake your head, or are you just like, mm, all right, I'm, I'm I, like, I got come you. Come on, let's get back to work. <laughs> <laughs> You're making this that's, difficult for me. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, I mean, that's your your story is incredible. Like, the, every time I say that now, in conjunction with you, just I mean, that's like double. Um, but your story is amazing. Um, and again, it's just, you know, it's life. So we're going to definitely, there's definitely going to be more stories. I can't wait to, um, to see the book because I already know there's, there's, it's often the people who are the quietest that they have the craziest stories. Yeah, it's, it's, so, it's uh, yeah. So tell people, um, one, if they want to like train with you, I think they can find you on everything. So if people want to train with you or they have questions, stuff like that, where can people find you? Um, confusedmuscles.com. You can message me on there or Instagram, DM me. I check all my DMs. Um, yeah, those are the best two, um, locations to really contact with me. There it is. Thank you so much, Eric, for joining Peaks and Valleys. Peaks and Valleys is produced by Josh Rodriguez and TKO Productions. Spoken word and voiceover is done by yours truly, Lem Gonzalez. Thank you for listening and remember, after the darkness comes the dawn.